Good, Michelle. Hi, everybody. We're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm so, so happy to be doing this. I love the PTs. I love teaching the PT. Um, so we're going to have a, a good session this evening. Um, question for everybody. How many PTs have you done to practice so far for this bar prep? How many practice PTs have you done so far? Let me know in the chat. Oh, good. Four, two, three to four, none, two, one, two, a lot of three, a lot of four, some zeros, 10. Good. Plenty of time still. Totally, totally. Those of you that haven't done that many, or if you haven't done any, that's okay. It's totally okay. Do two a week from here on out if you haven't done any. If you've done three, four, five, I want you to get to a total of having done eight. I want you to do a total of a, a minimum of eight. That's what I want. So whatever that takes to get you there, just spread them out. Just spread them out. And I reckon I recommend doing them the same day. So like on the Tuesday of the exam, whether you do the PT in the morning or in the afternoon, some jurisdictions are different. Um, do like do your PTs in the morning of that day or do them in the afternoon of the day that the exam is going to be. So definitely just get to doing, you know, do several, do several. Um, we can talk about PTs that I like and PTs that I think are particularly good to practice on as well. We can talk about that at the end. But first, let me show you all some really great products that I have. Let's see really quickly here. Give me one second. Well, it's my computer is being a little silly. Hi, Susie. Okay, let me just share something. This is going to show you the California version, uh, but I, I have the same exact thing for the UBE. So um, I just want to share this with you all because we're doing a really great session uh, or we're doing a really good bundle like promo. So I just thought I'd share with you all. So I have the same thing for the UBE. So what it is, is this is a database of every single past question and PT. It has every single qu past question and PT. And the, the unique thing about this is that I organize everything based on topic. So we have all the, we have the categories. I use the MEE subject matter outline, um, which you all should be familiar with. It is, where is it? Hang on one second. Okay. So I use this, the MEE subject matter outline. So every single essay is categorized based on the subject matter outline. So it's agency, we have them all organized by subject and then broken down by what they test and like all of the issues that they test in a particular essay. That way you can make sure that you are practicing essays and you're practicing essays in all of the topics. You're not just blindly doing, you know, a corporation's essay or a family law essay. You know that you are practicing and hitting the breadth of issues that are tested. So, um, so that's what this is. So it's, you have categories on the left here. If you click on it, for example, here, and this is, like I said, California, but we have the UBE version um, as well. Um, obviously, you'd want to use that version. Um, and it has all of the questions here. And when you click on it, it also has the point sheet. So it's the fact pattern and the point sheet or the analysis sheet. So a really, really great resource. Plus, it has every single performance test. And I organize them based on if they're objective, persuasive, or sort of odd or different. So just wanted to throw that out there. So we, this is normally $199. And what we're doing is we're doing a promotion of this along with our final forecast class. So I don't like doing predictions. Um, um, it, it won't work for Georgia specific essays because Georgia is a little bit different. It does work for all the UBE though. Um, we also have our final forecast. So our final forecast is, um, is really one of our most popular classes. So it's, it is a, a lecture that I do with on July 11th. It's on July 11th at 5.30 PM Eastern time and I lead it. So, um, so it's this final forecast lecture where I go over all sorts of different things. So I go over 
you know, how do, what do you do when you can't figure out what the essay is testing you on? How do you guess better on the MBE? Um, we go over PT tips, et cetera. We do some practices on like, what do you do when you're running out of time? Um, I also, and this is the big thing is I look at all, I look at what has been tested recently on the UBE. I also do this for California. For those of you that are here from California, um, I, I go through, um, and make a packet of essays. It's like I, the one I made for California. I finished it today. It's 40 essays. UBE will be about the same. And it is, um, so I put a packet of together with a packet of essays together with the point sheet that is narrowed in on what you should be focusing on, like all of the concepts that have not been tested recently, along with the frequently tested topics. So everything you should really be familiar with is tailored to the upcoming exam and it covers every single subject. So um, I'll, you also get a final two week study plan because it's about two weeks before the exam, how to organize when you don't know where to start, how to better guess, like I said. Um, yeah, so um, this, if, if you want to sign up for that, it's normally 250 for these two products, but we're doing it as a, as a promo, um, for 159. Yeah. And you don't have to be in my class for this. You don't have to be in my class, but you do have to be, uh, in a UBE jurisdiction. If you're in California, we'll have one of these as well. Um, so there is that product as well. Um, so it's a special thing we put together actually for this group this evening. So as a little promo for people that are here, people that registered for it, um, and you can share it, et cetera, too. But that UBE, that, that final forecast class is definitely a favorite, um, of, of most people. So people have found it incredibly helpful, um, and encouraging. I always really want to be encouraging when we are in class. Irene, yeah, there is one for California as well. There's one for California as well. Just shoot me an email. We're gonna do a little um, another session like this specific to California, and we'll we'll introduce that there as well. Um, but yeah, shoot us an email because we'll definitely get that together for you. All right, y'all ready to do a bit of PT? Um, you ready to do some PT practice? I would assume so. That that's why you are here. Um, oh, just one other like last helpful thing. Do you guys know that I do a podcast? So I have a podcast where I like review the law, basically. Um, a lot of stuff I do talk about that's like California specific, but there's tons of stuff that is like applicable to everybody. Um, so there it is. <laughs> Ashley, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. Um, uh, but yeah, there's a link. Um, there's a link. Jody Ann, you get it? You get it about two weeks before the exam because I don't want people just focusing on that. Um, but you get it about two weeks before the exam, although it'll be, they'll be ready in the next couple of days. So we'll, we'll release it a few days before the final forecast, because it's designed to be used in coordination with the schedule, which is the last two week schedule. Um, all right, cool. But yeah, there's the link to the podcast too. If you want to listen to it, follow it, please. It helps me out. Um, <laughs> did you guys see Archie running by? My little dog Archie is running around. Um, all right. So let's get into this PT. Give me one second. So first, we're going to do a little bit of review. First, we're going to do a little bit of review here. Archie is here to help. He's the he's the CEO of BarkMD. There's Archie. <laughs> and he likes to help with these. Um, do I share the replay? I'm not sure what you mean by that, Kenya. All right. Let me just, can you clarify? So today, we're going to really talk about approaching the PT. We're going to get into this. We're going to get into this. Yeah, here's Archie. He's a little bit blurred out. He is very handsome. Um, He's very handsome and he's happy. He had a surgery a couple, couple weeks ago and he's he's all better now. Um, oh, the replay. Yeah, we will post it. I have a free workshop course where all of our materials um, for everything that we've done in the past are posted. Um, I can I can post the link to that in case you guys aren't signed up for that. That way you can access everything. Thank you. Archie says thank you. Um, so that's where you can sign up and get access to all the other free workshops we've done past, you know, past workshops, etc. All right, so we're going to talk about approaching the PT today. We're going to do a little bit of writing together, really a bit of deconstruction, a little bit of deconstruction as well. All right, this is the process. This is the process. And y'all should write this down, write this timing down and the steps. I'm going to leave this up here for a few minutes so that you can write this down because this is incredibly important. So. The very first thing you do 
is you review that task memo. You review the task memo and you spend about five minutes doing this. When you are reviewing this task memo, there are five things that you need to identify. Five things you need to identify. You want to identify what is the tone? Is it objective or persuasive? Is it objective or persuasive? Who is the audience? And I remember this, I'll put this in the chat. Tone T equal, it's T-A-P-O-S is what I remember, tapos. T, so what's the tone? A, who's the audience? Who are you writing to? Client, court, opposing counsel, right? Are you writing to Archie? Who I wish I was always writing to, right? Who's your audience? Who's your audience? P, what's the product you're preparing? Is it a memo? Is it a brief? Is it a closing argument? My light's gonna fall off. Is it a closing argument? Is it a letter to opposing counsel? Is it a letter to client? Right, is it any of these things, All right? So tone, audience, product. Oh, how, what's your organization? How are you organizing the, an, um, the meat of the PT? How are you organizing the meat? Most PTs, I'm gonna get into this. Most PTs have like three main components, an intro, either analysis or argument and a conclusion. So it's really in the analysis or argument section. What does that look like? You always have subheadings in there. Well, what are those subheadings? How are you organizing by issue? by argument, by client question, what is it? And then S, any special instructions? We're gonna see some of these today, all right? So you wanna remember TAPOS, T-A-P-O-S, T-A-P-O-S. And just as a side note, I do, I know my, my MPT book got delayed. I have a California book. California is all 90 minute PTs as well. Totally works for, um, Persuasive brief is a brief, no, not a memo. You usually won't get a persuasive memo. You usually won't get a persuasive memo. I have a PT book where I go really detailed into all of these steps as well. Um, so just if y'all are interested, it, it absolutely works for the MPT as well. Um, it absolutely works for the MPT. Um, let me see. So I'll put a link in there for you to, for, to that for you as well, um, just in case you all want it. And we, it's, we do have a discount code for it too. Um, so I will give you that as well, just so you have it. If anybody's interested in that, because it is really helpful. If you like all these steps in this process and all this explanation, I think this book is worth it for that alone. Plus there's tons of great PTs in there um, as well. So. Um, give me one second. I'll give you all that coupon in case you're interested in that. I know a lot of people in here have it, um, already do have it. So, um, even for the, for the MPT and it, they find it really helpful. Here is the coupon for that too. All right. Yeah. Um, and we are potentially just as a heads up for everybody, we are actually, for those of you that really need to have like a hard copy. Um, um, we're actually going to switch to a software that's going to allow us to let you print some portions of the book. So like the, like the first chapter that gives you explanations of everything, um, particularly on the PT book. Um, so all of that, we're actually going to switch it. Even if you've already bought it, we're going to make it so that you can do that. So just as a heads up, that's coming out, I think on the 1st of July. So you can definitely still use the digital version until then, if you have it but we're gonna be switching that over just cause there's been such a demand for it. All right. Um, uh, and somebody asked me, cause do you guys know that I do like full actual MPT courses? So I have an MPT course. We have a live version where you can join live where I'm teaching, et cetera. And then we also have it um, as a version where you can, um, where you can just watch it recorded if you can't join live. Or like we've done three of the classes out of the five. Um, although the next one is my favorite. Um, but you get with the recorded version of the class, you, you just get access to the, the recording of the live class that we did. All right, let's get back into this. So step one, review the task demo, five minutes. Remember, you're identifying five things, tone, audience, product, organization principles, and special instructions, if any. 
Then you set up your PT skeletal outline. Then you set that up. Um, um, Sam, we're looking at that right now. We are looking at that. So one thing I want to say is show you all is a PT is a PT is a PT. Let me just switch really quickly. All right. So can you all see this, the word doc as well? You see both? Okay, good. So all PTs are basically the same thing. In all PTs, you basically have introduction, analysis or argument and conclusion. Like all PTs, it doesn't matter what it is. If it's a brief, it's a letter or whatever. If it's a letter, you just don't label the intro. That's it. Um, and it, yeah. So, so that's it, the, you know, the, what goes ahead of it, what goes kind of at the end, but it's mostly just at the top changes a little bit from PT to PT. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it is a, um, yeah, it changes a little bit, but it's really mostly the same. And that stuff really doesn't matter either. So if it's objective, you label this analysis. If it's persuasive, you label this argument. That's really the big difference, that's it. Um, and then, you're always going to have just like a quick little like one sentence intro if it's objective it's below please find my analysis regarding one da, 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 two da, 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 three right and then if it's persuasive it's just stated conclusion and it's usually you get this from your task memo and we're going to practice this a little bit today then your conclusion, if it's objective, it's, you know, thank you for allowing me to conduct this analysis for you. If I can be of further assistance, please let me know. If it's persuasive, you want it to be a conclusion. You want to state it, you know what you want to state what you're like asking for, but you usually mention the relief requested. Yeah. So relief requested plus your conclusion if it's persuasive. It's objective. This is persuasive. That's really the difference between these tasks. Any questions about that? All right, somebody asked, I'm, the UBE PT book will be out in September, which doesn't really help all you July takers, but California, it's just that we have, California does 90 minute PTs also. So they're great for you to practice on. Um, I personally think California ones are a little bit, well, I wouldn't say easier, but um, um, I, I, I find them a little bit less like time stressful. Um, time stressful, but, um, but they're great. It's still 90 minute PTs, the same people that write the MPTs also write for California. So, um, so you can definitely use it. It's interchangeable. And there's a couple things in the intro that like, where I give a little bit of background on California, but it's really the same for the MPT. My last sentence is, um, uh, what is your last sentence? Your conclusion or thank you. This is, this is for objective. And this is if it's persuasive. So you like actually state a conclusion if it's persuasive and you and you request the relief you want. So deny, you know, deny plaintiff's motion for whatever. Yeah. All right. So this is step, you know, so step two is basically setting up your skeletal outline. So after you review the task memo, hopefully you know what, you know, what the product is. Hopefully you know what the issues are that you're addressing and you can go and you can do your quick setup here. So we're going to practice doing that. Then there's step three. Step three is the only step that I'm okay with people skipping it if, if you need to. If time, if time management is not your strong suit, then skip step three. It's just where you skim the file. So you just kind of get a sense of what's going on. You get a sense of a bit more of a sense of the facts of your PT. It doesn't always help, but sometimes it does. So I like to do it, but it's totally something you can skip. So don't worry about it too much. 
Oh, let me just make this bigger now. All right, then step four, this is the biggest thing. And this is why you should like write down what each step is and how long you should take because you should like type that up, print it out or whatever. Every time you do a PT, you should note your timing on it so that you can identify what step trips you up because you need to adjust. You need to adjust. Um, if you get caught up, like this is how I tell people that to skip step three. Um, skip step three is you know that okay like because some people just get totally lost there i'm just putting that bundle in because people have asked for it too so there's that um so just click on that so you can save it uh, but type these up print this out print this out and keep track of your timing so skimming and reading the library so this is really really key so it's not like doing a skim and the reading in a full for each case you skim it until you get to the procedural history. And I'm gonna walk you through doing this. So you skim it till you get to the procedural history. Once you get to the procedure, then you start reading it. And what, what you're trying to do is you're trying to identify the rules, trying to really identify the rules. Sometimes you're identifying the policy, which is the reason for the rule. And you're also looking at the court's analysis, the court's application of the rule to the facts of the case. And Ed, you can skip reading, so you skip, reading all the fact paragraphs that are at the beginning of a case. We can just skip over those. And the reason for that is because all of the legally significant facts or generally the legally significant facts are going to be found in the court's analysis of the case. All right, and the analysis is really important. And then as you're going through, you're identifying, okay, I have, you know, whatever your issues are, you're saying, I'm gonna use this case for issue one, this case for issue two, this case for issue three, all right? Then uh, step five, this is where you actually type your rules, you draft your rules and you write what I call your rule proofs. And this is just saying how the court held. You just, the reason it's important to identify the analysis of the case is because everything that is said in the analysis section of the case goes here into your facts and reasoning. That's what this is. Um, a lot of people take too long typing the rules. One thing is one thing that you have to get good at and, and something that I try to emphasize is when you're reading for the rules, you're like asking yourself, are they repeating the same rule? Um, it's tough to summarize rules, I think. Um, yeah, Michelle, it is basically a summary of the library case, but it's just done in a specific way. And you don't, you know, I, I yeah, it's just done in a specific way. Um, I, yeah, I won't go off on that. So by, by the time you're done with step five, you should be 45 minutes through. You should have 45 minutes left. And then you are done with the library. You stick that away and then you go and you read the file. And you read the file and like usually um, what I do is I go through, I read the file, I'm marking it up um, and you will get hard copies. Yeah, you will get a, a hard copy of this. Yep. Um, so you go through the file and we're really sort of just like dissecting it. And the same thing with the library. When I'm reading it, I'm labeling what I'm using this for. I'm labeling what I am using it for. All right, so that's that's what's significant about it is, is like, that's what you do at step four. And this is, I think, key. And I think why a lot of people can get caught up um, in step four is I, when I'm going, when I'm doing step four, I don't necessarily understand everything that's happening. Like, I don't necessarily understand every rule. I'm reading it and I'm saying, okay, this sounds like this issue, this sounds like that issue, whatever it is, but I'm not trying to like really make sure I understand everything. And also it's really important that you don't spend so much time like reading the facts of the case that are in the beginning of the case. The relevant facts will be in the analysis. The relevant facts will be in the analysis in the case, all right? So, and that's what you wanna focus on. All of the facts in the beginning, you will get caught up. You will get caught up trying to understand it, keep people's names right and be like, wait, who was that? What happened, huh? It gets so confusing. Don't do that to yourself. Don't do that to yourself. I don't do that. I, I am understanding as I'm typing in my rules and my rule proofs. Like that's when I am understanding what's going on. Cause I'm kind of like putting the information together and it's usually like, because I'm rereading it as I'm doing it. 
So step four, I'm like dissecting the library. I'm like pulling it apart saying, okay, this goes to this issue, this goes to that issue, blah, blah, blah. Make sense? How many of you get caught up in step four? And do you think it's because, do you think it's because you're trying to understand everything? Yeah, yeah. I think that's for most people. Yeah. Yeah, so if you just really try to like, all right, dissect it. Um, yeah, dissect it. And I'll talk about like distinguishing. Uh, I will talk also about distinguishing like what rules versus policy, etc. And like when they're repeating the rules. But yeah, like it is so distracting to read all those facts in the cases. So don't do that. And then when you identify like the rules and like uh, when you identify, okay, this is a rule, this is analysis, you're just labeling that stuff. Um, and assigning cases to appropriate issues um, that, so you have to know what the issues are that you're dealing with. So I'm like, okay, you know, the first case, and we'll look at this. The first case deals with, um, you know, maybe the first case deals with, um, like maybe I have a case where I, I have, um, I'll use I'll use an example I know. I don't wanna use one from the class tonight where we are told that we're arguing a position. Um, we're told that we're arguing a position and the position um, is that our client is entitled to un unemployment compensation benefits. And there's two arguments that we wanna make. The first argument is that he resigned involuntarily that he resigned involuntarily. And the second argument that is, is even if he resigned voluntarily, it was for good cause. So when I'm reading the case, I'm like, okay, I know that this one, you know, this one is talking about voluntariness. This other case is talking about good cause. So I know this first case, Smith, oh, they're talking about voluntary. So that goes to issue one. Jones talks about good cause. That goes to issue two. So that's how I'm assigning cases to appropriate issues. Um, and so, I don't, so if you have watched my old videos and I'm talking about using certain colors for certain things, that was because I was, that um, video was released when the exam was given remotely, which is obviously um, not happening anymore. So you don't need to do that. I just bracket it. I just bracket it out. Okay. Yeah, you just, you just note it. Um, you just know what issue stuff is being used for on your actual doc, yeah. All right, then you draft your rules and your rule proofs, that's 15 minutes. Um, so that's at 45 minutes. Then you go into your file, you read your file and then you know facts start to make sense. And I'm like, again, I'm labeling it. Okay, this goes, this is issue one, this is issue two, this is issue three. I'm really just dissecting it. I'm just saying, okay, I'm gonna use these facts in the first issue and that's it. Yeah. Um, and then you write your analysis and you have to do two things. You have to compare and contrast the facts of our case to the facts of the cases from the library. And you have to make sure that you apply any rule that you have not discussed when you're doing your analogizing and distinguishing. You have to make sure that you apply that rule to the facts of your case. So apply every rule and distinguish. The thing that you will see when you do PTs is the facts of the cases in the library are of a similar nature to the facts of our case. So they're written very intentionally to do that, right? To make it a little bit easier for you. Maybe not easier, but to make it manageable. Yeah. Um, all right. Did everybody write this down, The what's on the screen? Anybody need more time? But type this, print it out, write it and do it, print it for every PT you do. Okay. All right. Now we're gonna get into our PT. Let me give it to y'all. Hang on one second. Let me put it in the chat for you all. Good to go.
One second. All right, I'm sending the PT through the chat. You can also get this, you can access this on the NCBE website. Do you guys all know that the NCBE website has a bunch of free PTs that you can do? Let me just give you the link just in case. And if you all remind me at the end, I will um, tell you which ones I like. Uh, Danielle, yes it is. All right. All right. So let me do a new share. Okay. Can you all see that? Should be able to now. Okay, good. All right. So what are the five things that we're going to look for in the task memo? And I'm going to make a note here, T-A-P-O-S, right? So we are defending our client, Franklin Flags Amusement Park. I always want to know who my client is. Some of y'all can't bring highlighters, that's okay against a negligence claim made by Vera Monroe, who seeks damages for multiple injuries she received at the client's amusement park. Last Halloween, Miss Monroe went through the haunted house attraction at the amusement park on the attraction's first day of operation. The haunted house attraction consists of a building made to replicate a haunted house and a mock graveyard. Miss Monroe claims that as a result of the park's negligence, she suffered injuries for which she is claiming damages of $250,000. Ms. Monroe has made three separate claims of injury due to negligence. One, she was injured when frightened by a staff member in costume in one of the rooms of the attraction. She ran into a wall and broke her nose, okay? Not very great. Two, after exiting the building and while going through the mock graveyard, she slipped on the muddy path and injured her ankle. Would you all sue if you slipped on a muddy path? I guess maybe. Y'all know that when dirt gets wet, it makes mud and the mud is slippery. Miss Monroe doesn't know that, but maybe it was very bad. Three, after exiting the graveyard and attraction, she was again frightened on the way to the parking lot by a staff member in costume, fell and broke her wrist. Okay. Let me just, let's just talk about this for one second. If you go to a, if you go into a haunted house attraction, right, uh, on Halloween, you go into a haunted house attraction on Halloween, do you expect to be scared? Yeah, right? Yeah. Okay. All right, we have concluded discovery and will now move for summary judgment. What's the standard for summary judgment? What's the standard for summary judgment? No genuine dispute of material fact. Yeah, no genuine dispute of material fact, which whenever I see that as a particular motion, I wanna think about the standard that applies. So I am attaching relevant experts from the deposition transcripts and case law. Please prepare the argument section of our brief in support of our motion for summary judgment. Do not prepare a statement of facts, but incorporate, <laughs> Kelly, I hope not, but incorporate relevant facts into, hopefully they're not your clients. Incorporate relevant facts into your argument. Do not concern yourself with issues of the plaintiff's comparative negligence or damages. Be sure to follow the attached guidelines for the preparation of persuasive briefs, right? So we have a format memo. This is a classic format memo. But let's fill up the TAPOS. 
right tone is it objective or persuasive i want everybody to tell me in the chat all at once yeah persuasive how do i know it because it's a brief i'm writing the argument who's the audience the court right what's the product i'm writing it's the argument section of our brief so i just really say the brief it's what it really is thank you how am i organizing how do you think i'm organizing Yeah, usually by legal argument, if it's something persuasive. Yeah, by each claim, right? By the three negligence claims. Any special instructions? Yeah. No comparative negligence, no damages. No comparative negligence and no damages and follow the format memo. All right, let's look at this. This is a very standard format memo. Often if you're writing a brief, you're gonna see something like this and usually it pertains to the headings. So here it says, the following guidelines apply to persuasive briefs filed in support of motions for summary judgment in trial courts. The body of each argument should analyze applicable legal authority and persuasively argue that both the facts and the law support our position. Supporting authority should be emphasized, but contrary authority should also be cited, addressed in the argument, and explained or distinguished. What does that mean? You have to include counter arguments. You need counter arguments in every PT, even if you're writing persuasively. Include counter arguments. And include good ones. Do you guys ever have a PT where you get to an issue and you're like, huh, like I go this way because of this, or what about this fact? And you're just kind of like hemming and hawing a little bit. Does that ever happen to you? It should happen to all of you. It happens to me every time. Do you know what that is when you identify that? So that's your counter argument. That's your counter argument. Generally though, your client on a PT is gonna get what they want. They're generally going to they're generally going to get what they want. OK, courts are not persuaded by exaggerated, unsupported arguments. We follow the practice of breaking the argument into its major components and writing carefully crafted subject headings that summarize the arguments each covers. A brief should not contain a single argument. heading. The argument headings should be complete sentences that succinctly summarize the reasons the tribunal should take the position you are advocating. A heading should be a specific application of a rule of law to the facts of the case and not a bare legal or factual conclusion or a statement of an abstract principle. Examples, improper, the applicable standard of care, proper. Because the applicable standard of care in a professional negligence case is not within the realm of common knowledge, a plaintiff must introduce expert testimony to establish the standard of care allegedly violated by the defendant. Do not write a table of contents, table of cases, statement of the case, or index. These will be prepared as required after the draft is approved. All right, don't worry about that stuff. So we're just telling you to write some good counter arguments. All right. So we've looked at the task memo, we've looked at the format memo. Right. Now I'm going to go to my doc. Let me just do a new share. Okay, so I have my word doc here, right? So I'm doing a brief. I am doing a brief. So I'm just gonna make it look like a brief. Who do I, so defendant, Franklin, flags, brief in support of motion for summary judgment. Uh, Monroe, the Franklin flags. This is how I set up a brief. Put my heading, and then introduction, argument, 
conclusion. Right. And then the question is, is what goes in here? So I have those three issues, right? A, uh, Franklin, and it's a summary judgment. Oh. So I'm going to incorporate, I don't know the facts and the reasoning yet, but I am going to tie in um, the facts of the, I, I do know my conclusion, right? We're moving for summary judgment on each of these. So no genuine issue of material fact exists regarding Ms. Monroe's um, broken nose injury because, and I just put like a bunch of X's as a placeholder because I have to fill that out right. And I don't want to forget that. No genuine issue of material fact exists regarding Ms. Monroe's um, injured ankle because XXXXX and no genuine issue of material fact exists. Can you all write the last one? Regarding um, Ms. Monroe's broken wrist because I put in my headings there. All right, and I'm gonna write a quick introduction. Um, so I'm gonna just state the conclusion like it was stated in the task memo, right? Um, defendant Franklin, I'm going to incorporate some facts and reasoning at the end. And it, no, not every task memo gives you headings like this one. Definitely not. The friend of Franklin flags. Um, and this, I, I know she has three negligence claims. Um, uh, is entitled to summary judgment regarding Ms. Monroe's negligence claim for her various injuries because, and I need to fill that in because I don't know what that is yet. And then conclusion. Side note, they also just told us to write the argument section of the brief. So you could just get straight into this. Like if you're somebody that runs out of time, you can just omit this and I'm at the end. Just do your argument. So if they that's something that's, that's okay. I always do tend to do it. I do have time. I'm pretty fast at writing PTs. I should be. Um, so that's something that like, if you have, if you really struggle with the time, that's something that I think is okay. Um, conclusion, address the relief that you want. So based on the foregoing defendant, Franklin flags has demonstrated there is no genuine issue of material fact um, such that it is entitled to judgment as a matter of law because, da, 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 da. and that's it. That's just our skeletal outline. That is step two. Make sense? All right. Go back to the PT. All right. Okay, good. All right. Okay. Now, step three, skim the file. I just kind of like to see what I have. Um, with transcripts, I want to know who I'm, who they're of. And I will, the only thing I will really do with the transcript is I will read like the first line of a big paragraph, right? So this is plaintiff depot. So I'm looking for these. Well, you go into this house, which has all these rooms with spooky stuff. It's Halloween, right? Well, she scared me to death. I wasn't expecting any like that, anything like that. Oh my gosh. 
Oh, my light just fell off. You guys can still see me okay, right? All right, let me just grab that and fix it. Sorry, everybody. Okay, just get comfortable again. Okay. All right. Well, and then I just see it says, well, we went out the door, there was this kind of pathway outside through a mock graveyard. So like, I might just be the kind of, um, this looks like incident one. This is incident one. And then it says, well, we went out the door and there was this kind of pathway through a mock graveyard, which is the second issue. So incident two, okay. Uh, my husband helped me up and supported me because now I was limping. Hey, once we were out of the graveyard back on the park grounds, I thought, okay, my husband picked me up and helped me to the car. I was a wreck crying. Okay. This is, I think this is number three because then she's out. <laughs> no, and I don't think these issues are actually super easy to spot. Um, but yeah, the, I, I, yeah, I guess, I mean, generally in a transcript there, I do think they're actually um, pretty good. Um, all right. I think this, the, sorry, I said pretty good. That was very vague. Generally, I think with a transcript, they're organized by issue, really. So yeah, and like usually like when you, you can go to these big blocks of text and usually it's going to be right there. Not always, but that is usually the case. Okay, and then here there's a cross-examination by my boss. And there's not really any big paragraphs here. I'll just see is was the graveyard illuminated? Yeah. Okay. And then excerpts of deposition transcript of Mike Matson. I don't know who that is. But Matson depo. I always like to write in the top right corner what each document is. That way, like if I'm looking for something, I can find it quickly. Okay, can you describe the haunted house? It's a new attraction, which we opened this last Halloween. So he much worse work for us. Oh, and it says I'm the general manager of Franklin Flats. So this is my client. Okay, I love, this is one of my favorite PTs. My great grandfather actually designed, he concepted the haunted mansion at Disneyland. So this has like a special little spot for me because it makes me think of it. Um. The new attraction, which we opened this last Halloween, it's a house, okay. Uh, we thought it'd be fun if once people thought they were out of the house, okay. What steps do you take to ensure the safety? And there's nothing, and there's this cross-examination. Miss Matson, could you describe the grounds of the park? Okay, and then I have this Camille Brewster. So Depo, Brewster. Okay, please state your name and occupation. I work for Franklin Flag, so she's a staff member. I do want to identify when I have depots. I want to know who these people are, who these people are. So this is also a client. We opened this new attraction, the haunted house. I was made up. Okay, so she looks like so she was in the haunted house. Um well, there was only one involving a couple that came through. I did what I'd been doing. So it sounds like she's just talking about the incident. She was there, she saw it. And there's not really any other big paragraphs and that's it. So that's skimming the file. That's it. All right. You all ready to get into the library? Oh, cool, Kelly. Yeah, my great grandfather was one of the original animators for Disney. Not that we have my family has Disney money anymore, but a long time ago. But yeah, my great grandfather did all the original films. Um, <laughs> yeah. I don't think I'd be doing this if that were the case. Maybe I would. I love what I do. All right, so let's get into the library. Okay, all right. So two years ago, the Franklin High Boosters Club, okay, so this is just facts. See, it's so easy to just get into this and I'm gonna skip that whole paragraph. The fundraiser netted 4,800, that's just facts. So I do not read these, I have never read these. The trial court granted the club's motion. Okay, here is procedure. This is where I slow down and start reading. The trial court granted the club's motion for summary judgment and the court of appeal affirmed. 
For the reasons stated below, we reverse and remand. A court will grant a motion for summary judgment. So here is a standard for an MSJ, which I want to include this, right? I want to include this. So this is my rule. Um, I usually will bracket off like that, just put little brackets around my rule to include. Because remember, I'm just dissecting it and I'm just trying to like pull it apart. What do I need? Just as a heads up, anything that is a standard like this is what's called an umbrella rule. So it goes underneath my argument heading and before like any rule that applies to all of the issues goes below the argument heading and, and above the first like subheading in the argument section. Okay. Larson cites Dozer v. Swift as establishing the standard for liability for negligence in cases of this sort. So here they're talking about Dozer. I, I often get asked about, um, about cases within cases and whether or not to use them. You generally do use them if they go into depth. So like here, they go into depth in this case. So this is like them giving you another case. So we'll talk about that. Or we'll, we'll, we're going to use this. In Dozer, the defendant was a coworker of the plaintiff. The defendant knew that the plaintiff was of frail constitution and had arachnophobia, an ordinate fear of spiders. Solely to play a prank on the plaintiff, the defendant obtained a number of live but harmless spiders and dropped them over the wall of plaintiff's cubicle while the plaintiff was sitting at his desk eating lunch. The plaintiff, in utter panic, fell backward from his desk chair and sustained, sustained a serious head injury. The defendant was found liable in negligence. So Dozer, I want to make a note of this. They're liable in negligence which I don't want to be liable, so we're going to distinguish. As the courts below correctly held, Lawrence, Larson's reliance on Dozer is misplaced. The first question is whether there is a duty. This is a rule. In all tort cases, the duty is to act reasonably under the circumstances and not to put others in positions of risk. So this is rule basically for negligence. In Dozer, the defendant did not live up to that duty and therefore negligently caused the injury to the plaintiff for which the defendant bore liability. That's a little bit of the analysis of Dozer. And this is all analysis of Dozer. But to say that individuals have a duty to act reasonably under circumstances, that is to avoid risk, is only the starting point of a negligence analysis. Once the court has determined there is a duty, it must next determine what duty was imposed on the defendant under the particular circumstances at issue, whether there was a breach of that duty that resulted in injury or loss, and whether the risk which resulted in the injury or loss was encompassed within the scope of the protection extended by the imposition of that duty. Here's the rule for negligence. So do you see how I'm really just like deconstructing this, pulling it apart? This is how I can go through this quickly, right? I'm not like stopping and pausing and thinking about this. I'm just saying, okay. And like, I know I'm dealing with three negligence issues. The question of the defendant's duty is not whether the plaintiff was subjectively aware of the risk. Rather, the question is whether the defendant acted re unreasonably under the circumstances via v the plaintiff. As the courts below correctly held, the particular circumstances here differ from those in Dozer. Now we're getting into the analysis of this case, Larson. Larson analysis. Because they occurred in a different setting. Therefore, the, defendant, the duty that the defendant owed to the plaintiff here must be analyzed in those particular circumstances. So this is the distinction. So they're getting into the um, analysis here. They do go back and forth between rules and analysis a bit. Okay, so one way to tell what is rule versus analysis is like just some of the articles that are used. So patrons at an event, which is designed to be frightening are expected to be surprised. They'll say patrons, right? Not Larson, not Dozer, right? They're talking about anybody, any patron at an event. So you look at that, if, are they talking, if they don't, if, they, if it does not look as like they are talking about the particular parties of the case, but it's, it is a statement that applies to anybody, that is a rule. 
but patrons at an event which is designed to be frightening are expected to be surprised, startled, and scared by the exhibits. The operator does not have a duty to guard against patrons reacting in bizarre, frightened, or unpredictable ways. Patrons obviously have knowledge that they can anticipate being confronted by exhibits designed to startle and instill fear. They must realize the very purpose of the attraction is to cause them to react in bizarre, frightened, or unpredictable ways. Under other circumstances, presenting a frightening or threatening act might be a violation of a general duty not to scare. What is this all talking about? What element is this talking about? In the chat, let me know. Yes, what is the duty? It's what is the duty? Yeah, this is duty. One thing I want to point out here is that there's definitely some repetition. Like here, really what you need here, let me, I'm going to re-highlight this to show you guys what you absolutely need. Because I know there's a lot of rule here. And one of the things I want to talk about was like strategically selecting. So patrons at an event which is designed to be frightening are expected to be surprised, startled, and scared by the exhibits. The operator does not have a duty to guard against patrons reacting in bizarre, frightened, or unpredictable ways. That's really all you need, right? Because it's just expanding on that. Like it's just explaining a little bit more. Like any more beyond that you can absolutely do. But this right here is really the general rule. What is the duty to do and what is it not to do? I might want to include more. Right, but like you have to know yourself and know like how much time um, you have. Like, where do you run out of time? Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Under other, and also there was a footnote reference here. The footnote reference is right here, and I just want to read it before I go to the next page. It says it is well settled that assumption of the risk is no longer a valid defense under Franklin law. The plaintiff's knowledge and conduct may be considered in determining whether, under the particular circumstances, the defendant breached a duty to the plaintiff. If the defendants found to agree to that duty, the plaintiff's knowledge and conduct are considered to determine the extent of plaintiff's comparative negligence. Didn't it tell us not to talk about comparative negligence? It did, didn't it? I believe so. Let's just double check. Total distractor. Yeah, no comparative negligence, yep. Total distractor, no damages, yeah. So don't fall into that trap. But check your, always check footnotes. For example, what, what did it say? Yeah, under other circumstances, presenting a frightening or threatening, threatening act might be a violation of a general duty not to scare others. For example, being accosted by a supposed vampire in the middle of a shopping mall on a normal weekday in July might indeed be a violation of a general duty. But in this setting on Halloween, the circumstances are different. I like that line because ours is Halloween. Right, I like this. Rule. Larson, and now they get into the analysis. See how they switch here? Now they're talking about uh, the actual party, Larson, and they weren't doing that in, in this other stuff, in this whole other paragraph before that. So analysis, Larson, by voluntarily entering a self-described house of horrors on Halloween, accepted the rules of the game. Hence, Larson's claim that the club was negligent in its very act of admitting him to the house of horrors because the establishment of the exhibit itself with features designed to frighten patrons breached the club's duty to act reasonably must fail. The courts below ended their analysis on that point and granted and affirmed the club's motion for summary judgment. But therein lies their error. But the proper analysis does not end there. Here, the first question, the further question is, what additional duty is owed by a party which invites a patron for business purposes? In this case, what is the duty of the proprietor or operator of an amusement attraction to his patron who is an invitee? So here, the operator impliedly represents that he has used reasonable care in inspecting and maintaining the premises and equipment furnished by him, and that they are reasonably safe for the purposes intended. The operator is not bound to protect patrons from every conceivable danger, only from unreasonably dangerous conditions. I'm gonna include that. More specifically, such proprietors and operators have an 
obligation to ensure that there are not only adequate physical facilities, but also adequate personnel and supervision for patrons entering the establishment. So, and like here, this is where there's a lot of rule here, right? And I totally get that. But this is also the first case and it's negligence, which applies to all three. So keep in mind, like there's probably going to be some repetition in the rules. So don't let it throw you off. Just like all of these PTs are designed to be done in 90 minutes. All right. Um, so let's just include this also. Larson claims that the record shows that there is a question about whether such adequate personnel and supervision existed here. Most particularly, whether the role-playing individuals who are part of the experience in the House of Horrors were adequately instructed should some unfortunate event occur, which injured a person. Larson raised that question in his brief opposing the club's motion for summary judgment, but neither the trial court nor the court of appeal addressed that claim. We cannot, on the record presented, determine if such adequate personnel, supervision, and instruction existed. Accordingly, a genuine dispute of material fact um, exists, which precludes granting the club's motion for summary judgment. So they don't actually go into this issue. Um, and no, you don't try to skip around. I move to the next one. Okay, so that's that case. This is really giving me a lot of the rules for negligence. Okay, now I have Costello, the Shadowland Amusements. Okay, listen to appeal from judgment of negligence. This is just facts. Defendant Shadowland cites our decision. Okay, this is actually getting into the, this procedure. Defendant Shadow on cites her decision in Parker as a defense. There, plaintiff Parker sued defendant Muir for negligence, claiming damages she injured uh, for injury for injuries she suffered as a result of her patronage of Muir's cornfield maze. So the maze consisted of five miles of path. Um, and here they talk about Parker. A five miles of path uh, cut into the cornfield. Parker accompanied the youth group from her church to the maze. What does this sort of sound like? If they're talking about a corn maze, which of our issues does this sort of sound like? The muddy path, yeah. Yeah, the muddy path. Yeah. Okay. She had specifically suggested that the group go to the maze on their outing because she had been through the maze at least twice before by her own admission. While venturing through the maze, she mentioned to the group that the paths were very rocky and they should be careful. However, she tripped over a large rock in the path, fell and broke her wrist. She sued Muir for negligence. The record showed that for the entire season during which the maze was open, this was the only reported incident. As we noted in Parker, Franklin Law, here's their stating a rule, Oh, my light fell off. That's okay. Uh, Franklin Law provides that the owner or custodian of property is answerable for damage occasioned by its dangerous condition, but only upon a showing that the owner knew or in the exercise of reasonable care should have known of the dangerous condition, that the damage could have been prevented by the exercise of reasonable care, and that the owner failed to exercise such reasonable care. We also noted the fact that an accident occurred as a result um, as a result of a dangerous condition does not elevate the, the condition to one that is unreasonably dangerous. The past accident history of the condition in question and the degree, so the fact that an accident occurred. And I'm also reading this stuff out loud, so it obviously takes me longer. Um, the past accident history of the condition in question and the degree to which the danger may be observed by a potential victim are factors to be taken into consideration in the determination of whether a condition is unreasonably dangerous. Further, the condition must be of such a nature as to constitute a danger that would reasonably be expected to cause injury to a prudent person using ordinary care. In Parker, so here's Parker analysis. We concluded that the mere presence of rocks on a path through a cornfield did not meet the standard for opposing liability. You don't need to highlight. The plaintiff there knew of the condition from her prior trips through the maze. She warned the members of her group about it. She voluntarily entered that maze with that knowledge. No prudent person in such circumstances using ordinary care would incur injury. 
Indeed, any reasonable person would not be surprised to find rocks in a dirt path. Would you be surprised to find mud in a dirt path after it had rained? No. The otherwise unblemished safety record of the maze prior to the accident here bores this conclusion. So I can do a real proof of that. Here, defendant Shadowland's reliance on Parker is misplaced. As we noted in Larson, every individual has a duty to act reasonably and to not put others in positions of risk. Shadowland did not act reasonably here. So here, I want to distinguish from this. What's this? This is Costello. It was obviously aware of the dim lighting, the placement of the bench, and it put it, it had itself put it there and the hazard the bench might present. This dim lighting by with the bench placement was a dangerous condition, one of which visitors were unaware, and the injury which resulted was one that Shadowland could have prevented using reasonable care. Shadowland did unreasonably put plaintiff Costello at risk and is therefore liable for Costello's injury. And that's it. All right. So yeah, a lot of rules here. Okay, let me. But not crazy. I don't think too, not too crazy. Yeah, I can put my marked up pages. That's one good thing in my PT book. Um, uh, in my PT book, I have like 10 PTs in there and every single one has my marked up PTs along with a step-by-step -step model answer. So that it's all in there. And I'm doing that for the MPT book as well, but that won't come out till September. This California one's great though. Is anybody in here taking February, not July? Yeah, if you are and you like you that you will be able to buy that. I also have some other really exciting stuff coming out for February. All right. Yeah, I hope you will. I hope the rest of you are not. Yeah, of course. I'm so happy. I have a hard time applying. Yeah, Michelle, you might want to do our class where I go through it. Um, I think there's like 10 PT samples in my book. I think there's about 10. I don't have to count though. It's every single 90 minute California PT. So it's a good mix. Closing argument brief, um, two closing arguments because I'm adding the February one. Um, memos, letters, all like everything. Okay. Let me do this. Just getting this open. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. I love doing PTs. I absolutely love doing them. Yeah, Barbary's not good. I know. Yep. I know, everybody. That's why I do this. Okay, can you guys see my two uh my two docs? I'm gonna do a new page. So I can leave that. Okay. So as and I go into this in my book and I'll show you guys all the book in, um, in a few minutes, um, but I go into this. So um, each in each of these sections, um, and this is like, if you remember your first year legal writing, um, <laughs> yeah, well, the, <laughs> I'm surprised. Uh, uh, yeah, I actually have like, worried sometimes and like wanted to take my free stuff off off because I'm afraid of other bar companies stealing it but I still don't think like other people can teach it as well like not to like toot my own horn um and I just feel like that's a disservice to you all um but yeah my marketing person doesn't want me to have all this free stuff but um I love doing it okay so let's talk about this so as we're going through, you're going to try to identify like what case goes where and like what rules go in other places. Remember I said that if you have like an umbrella rule, like the standard, so I have my rule here. So like, I'm probably going to have my like MSJ 
and my rule for negligence, both of which came out of Larson here. So um, the broken nose. And so here I have Larson and Larson has Dozer. I also have Costello and Costello has Parker. So I really have four cases. Um, I really have four cases. So, and I'd wanna know which case goes where. So it, usually after each case I read, I'm gonna make annotations. So that's where I, I say, like when I say skim and read the library um, you're, and identify which case goes where, it, it'd be here. And I just don't go back and forth when I'm teaching these um, because I like to mark it up on the iPad to show you like how you would actually mark it up and it just takes too long to switch back and forth. But after each case, I would make an annotation. So like, I think the broken nose one goes um, Larson. I think I'm gonna use that for the first issue. And I'm probably gonna do a rule proof here. Um, Larson also has Dozer. So I'm probably gonna also use Dozer. Definitely gonna do a rule proof there. And then the second case, and I just don't know for the third one because I don't really have enough information here. But a lot of this, this is all negligent. So it's really a lot of it, you're using the same rules over and over. So I don't necessarily have to have new rules down here. Um, but the injured ankle, that's definitely going to be Costello um, and Parker. And then I might have some rules from Costello and Parker here too. All right, you all follow along. So that's what we would be doing after step four. Like as I read each case, I would make a note of like where they go. Okay. And I just like to, I like to make a step-by-step -step breakdown of these. All right. It's not a silly question. Somebody asked what's the difference between a rule and a rule proof. It's, I'm gonna explain it like as I demonstrated, but a rule is a, a statement of what the rule is. Um, so what, and I go way in depth into this in my book. I don't have enough time to like explain it, but this is like what your, um, this is, I go in depth in, and in the classes. If you're in the classes, like I know a lot of you are here that are in my class and you guys can say like, I do definitely go in depth. Um, but it is all explained in the books as well. Um, but this is your, these are each a separate paragraph. So that's your, a paragraph of your rules that apply to that issue. I might, okay. This is my rule proof. The difference between your rule and a rule proof is a rule is just like your principle, right? It's the rule that applies. The rule proof is your explanation of how the court in the case applied the rules that apply to the facts of the case. So these are all different paragraphs. Yeah. This A is for application or analysis. You often have, um, yeah, exactly. The rule proof is essentially the holding and it's rationale analysis, yeah. You often have several analysis or application paragraphs. This C is counter argument. If you have a counter argument on that issue, uh, you definitely need counter arguments in your PTs. You won't have it for every issue though necessarily. And this is conclusion. All right, for this issue. Okay, so let's get into, let's start writing some of our rules. And I didn't wanna go all night with this, uh, but you guys should definitely finish this up. Um, but let me just start typing some of my rules. Okay. All right, so, so I just start typing in my rules here. So a court will grant a motion for summary judgment when there is no genuine dispute of material fact, the moving party is entitled to judgment matter of law. A, I often omit stuff like quotes um, because I just don't have time to do that. That takes me too long. Ugh fact for summary judgment. Purposes, I'm just gonna say is a fact that would influence the outcome of the controversy. And then I wanna put the rule for negligence. A defendant is liable for negligence when I'm getting some questions. Yeah, I uh, this is a rule statement for 
for what is the rule for material fact. Um, um, oh, P stands for proof, for rule proof. P stands for rule proof. Um, all of this, this will be posted in my free course site on my website where we post all of our free workshops. Um, that's where you can get the answer. Um, that's where you can get the answer. So I will put the link to that in the chat again. I do like to underline my cases because I think it makes a big difference. It makes it much more easy to see. Not a huge, you know, it's not really a big deal, but um, but I do like to do it. Okay. So a defendant is allowed from negligence when they owe a duty. Um, they breached that duty. Um, that resulted in injury or loss and whether the risk which resulted in the injury or loss was encompassed within the scope of the protection extended by the imposition of that duty. Larson. Okay, and then Larson also will duty. So patrons at an event which is designed to be frightening are expected to be surprised. Sometimes when they say like surprised, startled, and scared, it just omit some of those extra words. Like you don't need to say all the alternatives. Are expected to be surprised by the exhibits. The operator does not have a duty to protect against patrons reacting in bizarre, frightened, or unpredictable ways. Okay. Yeah, you just have to put the case name like this. I never do longer sites. I'm just going, I'm just going and typing in my rules. I'm gonna save this rule, but in this setting on Halloween, the circumstances are different. Yeah. Okay, the duty, um, it's here. And really, we don't need this. I just looked at this and I'm like, I actually don't need this. What I really need is this. What is the standard? The standard of care for um, uh, owed to invitees um, is, uh, is to an invitee owed by an amusement park to invitees um, is to ensure, so I'm cutting out some of the stuff that I highlighted as I go, because I'm like, I don't have time for all of this, is to ensure that there are not only adequate physical facilities, but also adequate personnel and supervision for patrons entering the establishment. Larson. Okay, so I've got my duty stuff in there. Whew. Okay, a lot in there. Okay. So let's write a rule proof. So to write a rule proof, to write a rule proof. Um, yeah, uh, we use this formula in case name. The court held holding because facts and reasoning, right? So that's what we do. So I'm going to do this first one. Um, I'm going to not put rules here, Larson and Dozer. I'm going to do a rule proof of Larson, and then I'm going to have you guys do a rule proof of Dozer. All right. So have a little bit of fun here. Um, Okay, hang on one second. So I'm gonna do it for Larson, right? Right. Um, 
Yeah. Okay. So this is what this is the analysis of Larson. So my rule proof is just explaining how the rules regarding negligence applied to the facts of the case in Larson. In Larson, the court held the amusement park defendant did not breach a duty of care to its invitee because the invitee, and I'm just gonna type in all of the facts that are in here, facts and reasoning, voluntarily entered a house of horrors on Halloween and thereby accepted the rules of the game such that, and I always turn it into one sentence, I don't break it up, such that her claim that the club, that the amusement park, or was club, actually not amusement park, claim that the club was negligent. You should have fixed my typos, but I saw it there and it bothered me. You can usually just leave them and it's very act of admitting the invitee to the house of horrors um, because the establishment of uh, the exhibit itself with features designed to frighten patrons breached the not uh, yeah, because game such as the couple is very active. Many of the that must fail. Because the, the establishment of the exhibit itself, I'm going to say, was, uh, yeah, with features designed to brighten, must fail. Yeah. Just type that in. That's it. And they don't go into they don't go in further. Right? What about Parker or Dozer rather? What about Dozer? Yeah, and I didn't have to put additional rules in because it was already up above. You do not do your rule proofs as you read the case. You finish the library. You finish the library at step four and you go back to it and you write your rule proofs. Okay, so let's write Dozer. Let's write Dozer. So let's do it a little bit together. Um, let's, where is it? Dozer, that's what I want. Okay, so in Dozer, the court held the, and I should, I should change that. The defendant, did the court say that they did or did not? Were they liable for negligence, yes or no? Were they liable for negligence, yes or no? Yeah, they were liable, they were liable in that case. So in Dozer, the court held the defendant was liable for negligence and breached its duty of care because all the facts and reasoning. Right, all the facts and reasoning here, which are all in here, I'm gonna highlight them. That if they were coworkers, the defendant knew the plaintiff was a frail constitution, had arachnophobia, played a prank, report all these spiders. Yeah. So in Dozer, the held the defendant was liable for negative breaches duty of care because, and it was not on Halloween, because the defendant was a co worker of the plaintiff, comma, the defendant knew the plaintiff had arachnophobia and solely to play a prank on the plaintiff, the defendant obtained a number of live but harmless spiders and dropped them over the wall of the plaintiff's 
I did it at lunch too. Cubicle while the plaintiff was sitting at his desk eating lunch, causing the plaintiff in utter panic to fall backward from his desk chair and sustain a serious injury. Right? Jonathan is on Halloween, thereby accept it, yeah. So the difference between these two, right? This one is just a prank on a normal day. This one, you're going into a haunted house on Halloween where they intend to scare you. Yeah. Yep. All right, so this is a real proof. And then we would go and we would read the file, right? You would do all of this. Um, and look, this I did this all in big font, so it'd be easier for you all to read it. They're actually not these huge paragraphs. Um, but yeah, you would just go in and then you go to the next, you know, the next case, right? And there's a lot of stuff in there, but that's okay. You just get through, you have 15 minutes to type it and 15 minutes to read it all. So like that's 30 minutes. There is sufficient time. Part of the, one of the things that I will say, something that I want to say, um, just in terms of timing is you really have to treat this. Like you have to practice, like you are under the gun. Like you really, really have to do that. Um, and like really push yourself, like set that timer. Do not give yourself extra time. You have to practice making strategic decisions and you have to do a lot of PTs in order to do them quickly and get used to like extracting the rules, writing your rule proofs. It's really just a matter of practice. Um, one more thing. Um, let me show y'all. Just again, if y'all, because people wanted to see the book. Let me share it. So we have this, this book, it's digital, but there are gonna be some components that are printable, um, particularly like the whole beginning. Um, so, but in this book, I, you know, I give a, a whole intro and stuff, um, what the PT tests, and then there's a study schedule. Um, but I talk about, I talk about each of the components of a PT that you can use. So like macro organization, then your organization and the analysis, the argument section. Um, then talk about the conclusion. And then like, I really dig into like each of those paragraphs, the rule, the rule proof, applications, counter arguments, conclusion, like really digging into these and give samples. I also like to color code um, so that you can see some of this stuff and you can see it in action. And I color code kind of throughout which is why this book is so expensive to print is there's a ton of color coding. Um, so I really go in depth in all of this stuff. I go through the process of doing PTs, every step like is laid out. And then, um, and then, uh, and then I give you um, all of the, um, I go into them for objective tasks, persuasive tasks, and then for each PT, you, there's a link so you can download the PT and you can print it and do it yourself. Then you have my annotated marked up version of it. So you can see how I mark it up so that you can, you know, do it the same way to see like, did you pick up on the same stuff that I did, et cetera. So um, the, the NPT version of this will be coming out in September. <clears throat> so hopefully y'all won't need it. Um, and if you buy, if you bought it now and you did need it later, I could switch you to the MPT one. Um, but hopefully that will not be you all. Um, yeah. And then just as a reminder that, um, those classes that the SARX is really, really helpful. You can practice like literally every single past. Um, uh, oh, awesome. No, it's not good for, um, it's not, it's, that's good for the book, DZ. That's good for the book. Samita, that's awesome. Um, yeah, so that California PT best, that's for the, um, what's it called? The PT book that I'm showing you right now. Thank you. Um, good PTs to do to practice. Yeah, I will talk about that in just a second. But if you all want the link to that, um, where is it? To the... 
No. Okay. Hang on one second. Um, give me one second. That bundle. Also, for those of you that are here, for those of you that are here, if you do want to join one of those workshops, one of our paid workshops, um, here's a $10 off coupon. So that you can use. Um, the recording is usually posted within about 48 hours. And I don't know if we're doing any more free workshops. Uh, my time is pretty slammed right now. Um, so um, let's see. Uh, all right. Um, but we do have that promo. Let me just give that to you. That bundle that we just did as like a special thing. The recordings are all posted to our free workshop course. But here is this, which is the um, the bundle for our final forecast and for SARX for the UBE for one fifty nine, which is normally two forty nine for both of those. So it's one fifty nine. So it's that that database that I showed you all earlier. It's here. Um, hopefully we see you guys in class. Hopefully see you in class. Hopefully see you at the final forecast. I hope you find SARX really, really helpful. Um, and yeah, we're going to do it for the California one too, Elise. Yeah. The bundle, it, it expires all of everything generally other than the books expire at the end of the bar cycle. But if you need it again, not final forecast, but for SARX, you can get it again for free. So if you needed to retake the exam. Um, Kelly, no, we'll, we'll have this uh, for the 159. I think it's going to expire in a few days, but we're going to have this for a little bit. Kenya, I think that that's good. Um, yeah, you, and you can do final forecast alone. And if you're already in the essay course, you get it. So if you're in my essay course, it's included. Um, but yeah, you can absolutely, um, you can absolutely do it. Um, yeah, you can just pay for the final. Yeah, Irene, you can definitely do that. We're going to send an email out. Actually, we're going to send out an email to everybody um, in the next day or two, um, everybody that was registered with a link to this bundle. Um, we're going to send out a link to this bundle and we'll also include the link for the California version. So just as a heads up on that. So we'll definitely include both. Um, and Kim, I'm so glad you love SARX. And Kenya, I'm so glad you found this so helpful. Everybody, thank you so so much for coming let me just talk about a couple of good pts to do for practice so um, on the ncbe website some of the free ones i just have to click through um was that what i'm not sure what you're talking about the classes i have i have courses that are on my website that you can purchase so for february 2018 i don't know those ones as well july 2017 there's a couple of good ones there's one not to do. Peak and In Ray Zimmer Farm. These are good. So the February, I'm sorry, the July 2017, both of those PTs are great. Um, the one that we just did was, I think, July 2013. July 2016. Um, In Ray Worley is a great one to do. It's tough. Um, I don't. Mm, I would do the other two peak. I would do In Ray Worley. I would do this one that we just did, Monroe v. Franklin Flags. What is this one I just clicked on? Miller v. Trap is a good one. And I think In Ray Anderson is also good. There's really, I think all of these PTs are good, except there is one that is atrocious that I would not do. I like Rowan. I like Peterson Engineering. Hold on, let me just get this. Palindromes. I don't love palindrome. No, I don't love palindrome. No, it's called Inray Community General Hospital. This one. Do not do Inray Community General Hospital. I mean, you can, you should look at it, but it is the only PT that I've ever seen that doesn't have any cases. It's all statutes. Yeah, it is good. And this is, these are also good for California takers. All right, everybody, that is it for tonight. Thank you so, so much for joining me. I love doing these. Um, yeah, if you all have any questions, feel free to shoot us an email. We'll send out an email though tomorrow with the link. 
uh, for the bundle. We'll send out a California and a UBE one. Um, thanks so much, everybody. Have a really great rest of your day. Good luck studying. Bye. Thank you.